Good evening. My name is Ted Landsmark. I am director of the Kitty and Michael Dukakis Center for Urban and Regional Policy, and I'm also the facilitator of Northeastern University's Open Classroom, which this semester uh, has focused on how design has transformed communities. Um, and uh, this semester in particular, we're uh, thinking about ways that uh, the new administration in Washington uh, will be making investments in a range of uh, design interventions such that uh, communities may be changed uh, around health and uh, gathering and uh, public spaces and recreation. And tonight, uh, we have the opportunity to uh, hear about a Rudy Bruner Award winning project um, that focuses on education in a way that will open up, uh, we hope, um, some very uh, broad and deep thinking uh, about uh, the role of, of what we traditionally called school buildings in communities and the way in which we've learned, particularly in this post COVID era, uh, about the role that schools can play as real centers in community. Uh, logistically, I remind folks that if you have questions, uh, you can submit them to us in the Q&A box. And uh, there's also a chat box uh, if you have side comments, but uh, we will get to as many of the questions tonight um, as, uh, as you pose. And with that, I will turn this conversation over to my colleague, Anne-Marie Lubina. Anne-Marie? Wait, you're on mute. There you go. The hang of this. Hi, good evening, everybody. My name is Anne Marie Lupinow, and I'm the director of the Rudy Bruner Award for Urban Excellence at the Bruner Foundation. Uh, for those of you who don't know us, the Rudy Bruner Award is a national urban design award that recognizes transformative places that contribute to the economic, environmental, and social vitality of American cities. Since 1987, the Rudy Bruner Award has recognized 88 places across the United States and shared their stories with detailed case studies that are available on our website. Over the course of the spring 2021 Myra Craft Open Classroom, we're tapping into this network of award-winning places to explore how cities across America are addressing challenges like uh, increasing socioeconomic inequity, racial justice, and resilience through design. In tonight's session, we'll travel to Memphis to visit 2019 Rudy Bruner Award Gold Medalist Crosstown Concourse, the transformation of the historic 1.5 million square foot former Sears Warehouse and Distribution Center into a vertical urban village anchored by arts, education, and healthcare. We'll learn why a school was an essential component of the vision for the development and how a local community-driven effort leveraged national resources to create Crosstown High a grade nine through 12 school. And we'll discover how the 16 acre Crosstown Concourse campus provides the foundation for real world learning through collaboration, exchange and community building. Tonight's presenters include Todd Richardson, the president of Crosstown Redevelopment Cooperative and co-founder of Crosstown Arts in Memphis. Since 2010, he's led the $210 million transformation of the former Sears building into Crosstown Concourse. Dr. Richardson is also an associate professor of European Renaissance art at the University of Memphis. Ginger Spickler is chief of staff at Crosstown High, a project-based learning high school serving a diverse by design student body. She spearheaded the community effort to develop an application for the XQ Super School Challenge, a nationwide contest to rethink high school that led to the creation of Crosstown High. They'll be joined by Ron Bogle, president of the National Design Alliance, He's leading Reimagine America Schools, a national initiative to bring together thought leaders from education, technology, design, and civic community to rethink public education and the built environment of America schools. As Ted said, it's gonna be a really interesting discussion. Now I'll turn this over to Todd and Ginger. Thanks, Emery. Hi, everyone. So what I'd like to do just to start us out, um, I've got a short video, It's it's a, one of the things that we did early on with the Crosstown project um, back in 2012, actually, we started the project in 2010 and, and opened 
uh, the new Crosstown Concourse renovated building in 2017. But we gave ourselves about a 2% chance of success uh, back then. It was kind of the middle of the, not kind of, it was the middle of the recession. It was 1.5 million square feet, 25 football fields of space um, that had been abandoned for over 20 years. And we thought maybe just maybe uh, an art history professor could help bring it back to life. So thus the 2% chance of success. Uh, so um, what I like to do to start out is just show this video. We, we um, started videoing um, the process early because we, if we were gonna be successful, we wanted to make sure that it was documented. And so if you're interested in the resource um, that'll, resources that'll come along with this class, there's an hour long kind of feature length uh, documentary on it. But I'm just gonna show you the trailer tonight because I think it, it does a good job in communicating kind of the sensibility of the project, the team that, that was put together to make it happen. Uh, and that's not just the development team, but what we call our founding partners, our, um, our major anchor tenants that came together, all of whom are in arts, education and healthcare. And it's really that combination of arts, education and healthcare that came together to make the, um, what we like to refer to as a vertical village come to life. So I'm just going to uh, share my screen. Whatever it take to bring it back, put there we go. I want to see it come back. Whatever it take to bring it back, put some more life in this building. And I think it'll do the community a whole lot of good, sure thing. I mean, it might bring outside people in here to do some work, some business. Yeah, I don't think it should be left like this. It's just too good. And, you know, and I look around the town when I go around, all these empty buildings, you could build some of that thing, put all them people in this building to produce and make money. Yeah, and it's a good structure, it's stout, sure is. You can put anything in here. Yep, I hate to see it like this, kind of hurting. Mm -hmm. Back in 1926, Sears wanted to open a distribution center in Memphis. They come scout around, do it very, very quietly, and they look into the Crosstown neighborhood. So in 1927, 2,000 men worked 24 hours a day, only stopping from midnight on Saturday to midnight on Sunday. The building was completed and operational in 180 days. That's almost unheard of. The original building was more than 650,000 square feet. The building included the retail store, the catalog distribution plant for like seven states. Sears at that time was a major catalog store. And to be able to have a distribution center here meant if you were living in Arkansas or Louisiana or Alabama, you took the Sears wish book and you filled out the form and you mailed it in, you were going to get your products that much quicker. I mean, it's a major economic development for the city. My first day in this building, just before going to the first grade, my mother brought me down here from the Greg School area on a streetcar, and we bought blue jeans. I'll never forget the smells in the building. They had a candy shop, peanuts and pecans. Remember, when I first came here, Sears was probably the largest single employee in the city. We were the FedEx of Memphis at that time. This is where I met my wife. <laughs> right here at this cash register. There were always a lot of activities going on in the plant. A lot of the employees got together. We would have skits. We would have programs on July the 4th. We had contests. They called all the managers and all the supervisors up to the 11th floor. Our general manager walked in and he read a letter to us that they were closed, that Sears was closing catalog. and to the people with families or even if you weren't ready to retire, this was devastating news. There were people that loved this property, loved the, this structure. People would stop me if they see me out in the yard cutting the grass and they'd say, can you take me in there? I want to see that place. My grandfather worked there. It was just a big 
empty place. And so one day I saw some young men, they were walking around and looking over the building across the church. I went across and introduced myself. Are you trying to do something here? And Chris Minor called me and said, yes, we are here. We're trying to do a feasibility study for that building. So basically the conversation started out with, wouldn't it be cool if? And it was purchased purely for a civic, with a civic vision. No, no developer in their right mind would, would, would purchase this building. <laughs> We put together a development team and we started off with a year-long feasibility study that really looked at can anything happen with this building and if so, what? At the core of that was the arts, music, visual arts, performing arts, multidisciplinary. We also started Crosstown Arts, a nonprofit that was to facilitate the conversation but at the same time begin to have events in the building, in the neighborhood to bring people back to Crosstown. It was an initial effort about renovating a building, but it was also about building community. Anyone who had real experience doing this would have just said it's a completely ridiculous idea. That the building's too big and everyone involved that had anything to do with the project on any level, they all share a little of that Memphis style of hardcore believing in something regardless of how crazy it might seem on the surface. In the initial introduction to the building, I think the emotion that that sparked, the moment that Frank, he unlocked the door and you walk in, just a sensation of awe at the magnitude and scale scope of this building. By the end of the first year, we didn't have the words to apply vertical urban village. The only thing that we could say is beyond mixed use. And so it was less about simply retail and office and residential coexisting like a traditional mixed use approach, but it was more about recruiting tenants who actually wanted to be next to each other. We did a back of the envelope and realized this can happen if these things work out, and there was a list of about 25 of them, then the project will happen. If any one of those things didn't work out, then the project won't happen, but there was a pathway forward. With the organizations that we had, and Scott Morris has also a third party advocate for the project. If we started in 2009, it was August of 2012 that we first officially announced to the public what we were up to. I'll be very, probably too honest. When I was first approached with this opportunity, I was like, it's a great deal. It's good for the city. <laughs> this is gonna be a humongous task being a native Memphian. I didn't want to be the one who stood in the way of this project getting done. And that's why I jumped on board real early and with one meeting I said, we're gonna see what we can do. This is one of the biggest projects I ever been on. I see the character they leaving in the building. There's a movement going on. Instead of tearing down some of your valuable properties, the building can be saved. I think you can bring it back and keep character in Memphis. One of the most memorable moments in my life was when all 32 sources of financing, the attorneys for each of those different groups sent out an email that said, we are ready to close. And it all happened within about 45 seconds. As a young developer, understanding the power of inclusion and diversity and how that really impacts a product and the results of something being great, that's instrumental. We're updating me periodically and they say there are some things we're working on and hopefully we're going to present them to our group and see what they will think of. And so when finally they say that there's a viable group that's going to pick up this building and willing to invest in it, I really, I, I shouted like a little hallelujah. And I'll never forget, we were riding on the bus. We were bringing kids back to school, bringing them back home. And one of the younger ones comes up and he sits next to me and he's looking at the building and he says, Miss Jazzy, are we moving in that building? And I said, yeah, in a couple of months, we're gonna move in that building. And he said, Miss Jazzy, does that building kind of, sort of belong to us? And I looked over and I could see that sign, yours slash ours, down the side of the building. 
And truthfully, I was able to answer, yeah, it belongs to us. Okay. Oh, actually. I had to see everybody's face after that video because I cry every time. So <laughs> the panelists are the only faces I can see. So I felt like uh, I needed to see a face. All right, so you can still hear me. You still see everything okay? All right, I'm gonna go back and um, share my screen and turn the, the PowerPoint. <laughs> Thanks, Ron. <laughs> Really a beautiful presentation, really. Thank really. you, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so what I'm going to do uh, is just simply stay pretty high level. I'm gonna introduce the project. I'll hit on a few um, of the points that you saw in the video, go into a little bit more depth on a couple of points. Um, I'm gonna spend just about 10 minutes doing that because I wanna make sure that we have um, enough time for, for Ginger and talking more in depthly about the school. So just to situate, because I know most of you um, aren't in Memphis, if any of you, and so just to situate you in terms of where the building is. So on the left of your screen, you see the river, uh, Mississippi River, and then uh, downtown. Um, as it gets more green, as you go into uh, on the right side of the screen, that's Midtown. And then um, on, the, on the kind of the south side, if you will, of, of your screen, that's the medical district. Um, Memphis is home to, eight different medical institutions in the medical district, including St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, uh, Le Bonheur Healthcare, um, as well as University of Tennessee Medical School, Dental School, Nursing School. And then Crosstown for a long time was um, an area, a neighborhood, well, for a long time, from 1927 to 1983, everybody knew Crosstown. Um, and it grew up kind of around the building. As a matter of fact, just kind of above and to the right of the end of Crosstown, you can actually see Sears Crosstown on the map. Um, and, but when, when Sears closed, um, Crosstown, the neighborhood kind of fell off the mental map of most Memphians. And so um, looking at our core area of the city, it was kind of that missing variable. And our hope was that by, by renovating Crosstown, bringing it back to life, that it would be um, kind of a last variable in knitting together a really strong center city. So that gives you a sense. It's about um, two miles from the river. So that gives you a sense of where it is in, in Memphis. And then um, it, just in terms of where we started at the top, this is uh, 2013. Uh, by that point, the building had been uh, abandoned for uh, about 20 years. And um, as a result of that, the, the neighborhood around it was also extremely disinvested. Uh, one of the, one of the um, sources of financing we had was New Markets Tax Credits, which are uh, federal um, subsidies to incentivize development in low-income census track, tracts, which um, Crosstown was one. And then in the bottom is where we have ended up just uh, about a year ago. You can see that um, instead of being abandoned, it is literally a little city. Uh, where now 3,000 people come and go every day. Well, not now, pre-COVID and post-COVID, uh, 3,000 people come and go every day. So as you saw in the film, 1927, um, Sears built its, uh, its, its regional headquarters in Memphis, where it was the, the um, distribution center for the catalog that you all may remember. Uh, top left is the 1927 version of that. There were 1,500 people that worked in the building and they handled about 45,000 orders uh, every single day. Um, so things went well uh, in, in Memphis for Sears. It was one of their top, top performing distribution centers. From 1927 to about 1965, they added on to the building. So they started out uh, with 650,000 square feet. There were five additions over the course of the next um, 40, 40, 45 years. Uh, to um, get it to the 1.5 million square feet that it was. It was the Southeastern Regional Offices, retail store and uh, warehouse and distribution. So um, it, you all may remember in the late 80s, early 90s, um, Sears, Sears was the Walmart, right? I mean, it, it, um, 
it had kind of a not monopoly, particularly on the mail order business. But then in the late 80s and early 90s with Walmart and service merchandise, Circuit City and all sorts of others uh, came about and, and had, they had competition really for the first time. And as a result, um, began to decline uh, so much so that by 1983, they had closed the retail store, kind of turned it into an outlet store. And then in 1993, they shuttered the whole the whole building. And then this is a um, this is a shot from 2013. So from 1983 to 2013. And when I say they closed, they left it all. And so after 20 years, this is uh, these are just shots of what the building was like. And and I'll say this. Um, it, it, it was very similar across the street, what used to be vibrant retail and, and other things across the street, all of those buildings were became empty within 10 years of Sears closing. So for us, um, we, we knew that it wasn't just about a building. As I said in the video, um, I always talk about using building both as a verb and a noun. It was about renovating a building, but it was also about building community. And we knew that we, we had to do more than just think about the building because if, if we put things in the building and it's successful, but then nothing happens around in the neighborhood, then kind of what's the point? The whole point was bringing, bringing up the area. And so the other thing we knew is that Crosstown, the neighborhood had just kind of been forgotten um, by most Memphians. And so we, um, we decided to start Crosstown Arts, which is a, a, a nonprofit contemporary arts center um, that began to have events and programming in the building, around the building. We also renovated some space across the street. And the whole point was just to have hundreds of events over the course of two or three years, uh, high quality events, unique events to bring people back to the area and remind them what a great place um, Sears Crosstown, or at least the Crosstown area was. The other thing we did is, um, those of you that are in Boston, um, uh, Old Sears building is not foreign to you. There are actually 10 of these across the country. Uh, three have been demolished and um, six have been renovated. And then the one in Los Angeles is now under construction. But what you see here on the top left is the Landmark Center. Uh, top right is uh, the headquarters of Starbucks in Seattle. Uh, bottom left is Pont City Market in Atlanta and uh, bottom right is Midtown Exchange in Minneapolis. We were able to look at what uh, these other projects were doing across the country. Um, and so for us though, the question was really less about what to do with so much space. Um, it was less about the space and the space just to be filled. And it was, it was more about how do we create um, a whole new neighborhood. We really saw the 10 floors of the building as an opportunity to bring together components, not just to co-locate, to, but to actually be better because they're together. This is a sign that I love from one of the events we had, said, here, here comes the, the neighborhood. And so um, this is kind of a, a dollhouse view of, of uh, the cutaway of the building. And so what we, what we decided to do was to think about the building as a neighborhood and the, the components of a neighborhood of, of being you know, residential, um, good, good education, health care, arts, entertainment, food, and green space. And, and what you would do normally in a traditional neighborhood is all of the, those things would be spread out horizontally. And what we decided to do was to bring all of those components of a great neighborhood together, but to do it vertically in the 10 floors that are the, um, the Crosstown building. So on the first floor, you've got uh, retail, but only about 50 to 55,000 square feet of retail. So everything from coffee and ice cream and a little grocery store uh, to a bank branch, a pharmacy, a hair salon, nail salon, just all of those little things that a, that a village needs. On the second floor, you've got Crosstown Arts, which is a contemporary art center that has galleries and performance space, um, as well as a cafe and an artist residency program. And then if we have an anchor tenant, it is Church Health. Um, Church Health is the, they, they provide quality health care to the working uninsured. Um, so if you work a part-time or contract, uh, independent, um, and you don't have health, health insurance, you can get primary care um, as well as uh, behavioral health, eye care, dental care. They serve about 55,000 patients a year here at Crosstown now. Um, floors three four, um, three, four, five, and six are office spaces. 
Methodist Healthcare has uh, essentially one floor at 100,000 square feet. St. Jude Children's Research Hospital rents 40 of the apartments. And Alzac St. Jude, the fundraising arm of St. Jude, has about 50,000 square feet. We've got about 45 tenants total. Um, and then on floors seven through 10 are 265 apartments where about uh, a little over 500 people live. So uh, all told, you've got, um, you've got about 1,500 people that work in the building, uh, about 500 people associated with the high school or will be anyway when they're all night through 12 plus, plus their staff. Um, and then you've got over 500 people that live in the building. And then you've got another 500 or so that are coming and going related to um, uh, all of the retail or doctor's visits uh, or, or whatever. There's also a 25,000 square foot YMCA on the second floor. Um, in terms of the setup of the building, it's really um, designed around three main atria. This is our central atrium, which you saw in the video. Um, the other thing that Crosstown Arts is, does is, is it, it coordinates ongoing events and programming. Um, so once a month, we have a big event um, that, that is uh, an event where you know, hundreds, depending on the event, thousands of people come and it may be live music, it may be crafts and drafts, it may be um, our Christmas event, but it's just one way to continue to activate the building and, and bring people here. But the Central Atrium also has, you can see on the right, uh, what we call the big stair. Uh, it's a 25 foot wide stair in the middle of the Central Atrium that acts as kind of an amphitheater. It's um, kind of a plug and play where we have uh, gatherings and meetings and presentations uh, on a regular basis. The West Atrium, uh, you see on the right, kind of a before in the middle, the after of that same space, and then on the left, just uh, kind of that is activated. We, the other thing we wanted to do from a wellness standpoint is we wanted to make sure all of the atria had monumental stairs that called your name to walk up it and down it as opposed to take uh, the elevator. So you could see it in the big stair in the central atrium. And now this is what we call a ribbon stair that goes from the first floor all the way up to the sixth floor. This is also the main entrance to the YMCA, which you can see there on the, on the left photo on the second floor, you can see the elliptical machines and bikes that overlook. Um, and on a regular day, it's great because you're in the West Atrium, you actually see wellness kind of being produced there. Uh, my favorite stay in the building, uh, this is second floor um, at Crosstown Art Space. Uh, so we created this spiral stairs. So the way that they used to uh, get packages or get goods from the 10th uh, and from the third to the 10th floor down to the packaging and distribution on the first and second floor is they had these huge spiral chutes that went from, went from the 10th floor down to the third floor in various places in the building. So we created this uh, spiral stair that kind of rips off of that as a reminder of that distribution history. But it's also the main entrance to Crosstown Arts Galleries, uh, performance space, uh, cafe area, and the artist residency studios. And then last couple of slides here. Um, the other thing is I mentioned top right, uh, a YMCA that's in the building. Uh, top left is the pool uh, for the YMCA. So uh, apartment residents um, have, have access to the YMCA and the pool, but also love the fact that there's 1500 people working in the building who can during their lunch or after work have such easy access to exercise. Uh, two new buildings that were built um, just, uh, just next to uh, concourse. On the north side is a 425 seat performing arts theater. Uh, really another great example of better together in the sense that Crosstown Arts um, needed a or wanted a live music venue and a film venue, um, but Methodist also needed a large group uh, meeting area. The high school needs a theater as well for its kids and their performing arts programming. As you can see in the building in the top right, those columns are about every 20 feet and they don't go away. Um, so the theater is an opportunity for everyone, church health, Methodist, the school, Crosstown Arts, et cetera, um, to be able to have this space and use it on a regular basis. And then of course, what do you do without beer? Uh, bottom left is uh, Crosstown Brewing Company that um, was constructed and opened in 2018. Uh, I always say concourse has to be successful because on the west side, you've got a brewery on the right side, on, on the east side, you've got pizza. So everything in between just has to work. 
Um, and then just to show you a, a couple of our, um, uh, four of our uh, tenants or, or to give you an example, and then I'll pass it off to Ginger, which is another important founding partner. Um, top right, I've already talked about, which is um, church health and, and the uh, quality health care to working uninsured. Um, the bottom two are examples of Crosstown Arts programming. Um, the bottom left is in a space called the Green Room, which is uh, by that red spiral stair that you saw, which is a, a live performance uh, space for music um, that happens uh, for about 150 people at a time. And then arts education on the bottom right is key. Uh, component of art of Crosstown Arts programming. And the top left is Global Cafe, where there are um, three chefs um, that are that are refugees. It's uh, dedicated to showcasing um, food and culture uh, of these refugees. So here you've got Venezuelan, uh, uh, Syrian, and Nepalese. So I hope that wasn't too fast, but I really want to get to Ginger. Um, Is that okay. okay, everybody? That gives you a high level. Um, last thing I'll say, Ginger, is um, is the from the beginning of Crosstown Concourse and a vertical village is a school, and so we didn't we didn't know how the school was going to come about. Um, we knew it would probably be a public charter school. Um, but nevertheless, we went ahead and designed the site um, to accommodate a school which has its own requirements from a state code perspective. And, and so we located the school so that it could have its own entrance, its own elevator, its own stairwell, um, had a drive, uh, a drive lane, drop off lane, so that the flow of traffic around the site could also work. So it was really a honestly, a, a little bit of a leap of faith for us because we um, were designing all of the, all of the space and the site according to school, but not knowing how it was going to, how it was going to come about. But we, at the end of the day, the idea of having a high school where, where, where kids had immediate access to um, partners like Church Health and Methodist and St. Jude and Crosstown Arts and others um, was just too much, you know, too good to be true. And so and sure comes along and uh, in an unpredicted, beautiful way. And so that's how I'd like to pass it on to Ginger. So meanwhile, oh, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think Ginger will answer a number of the questions that are coming in about uh, uh, the housing mix and, and uh, affordability and uh, some of the other uh, aspects of this project, but um, I, I do have to uh, ask uh, Todd directly. We're, we're broadcasting from a university, and one of the first questions that uh, came in was around how it is that an art history university <laughs> professor uh, could become a community developer. So if you could just answer that, and uh, then we'll turn it over to Ginger. I ask myself that question every day. <laughs> um, well, it, you know, it's really not a, a far stretch in the sense that um, I involved from the art side. And so I'm an art history professor. I was in an art department at the University of Memphis. And so um, Chris Miner, who's the, the, the co-founder and now director of Crosstown Arts, we uh, founded Crosstown Arts together and we, we had seen, so I, I moved to Memphis from Amsterdam. I'd been in the Netherlands for five years and before that in California for three years. And so I'd seen a fair number of large scale industrial projects that had been recaptured um, with uh, an arts centric kind of focus that was the spark. Mass Mocha is a great example in, um, in, in the US. And so it was really with, frankly, Mass Mocha um, uh, in mind that we approached this process and went there and talked with, uh, with the founder and director at, at Mass Mocha. So we were extremely naive, uh, no question about it. Um, we, pe people will say Crosstown happened because Todd didn't know that it couldn't. Um, and so I got involved really from the art side and then over the course of time, that led me into um, the community development side of it. Ginger, you're on. 
All right, I will jump in from there. Um, Crosstown High has a similar story of um, it, it happened because I didn't know any better than to not try to make it happen. So here we are. Um, and I, I do want to point out that um, Todd is sitting in the building, but you can't necessarily tell it, but I'm actually sitting in my office in the building and you can see the outside of the building from my window. So that is actual Crosstown Concourse outside my window. Um, so yeah, so I um, was able, I was, I still don't exactly know how I got here, but um, it started with a newspaper article in Memphis. Um, there, it was in, I believe October of 2015. And um, as Todd said, there was, um, you know, a always a plan to have a school at Crosstown that they had set aside the space and knew that a, a high school could be a really incredible part of this community. Um, and originally there was another charter management organization in town that thought that they were gonna be able to take that on and ended up um, not having the capacity for that. And so in, in October of 2015, I remember reading an article in the paper um, that you know there was this kind of empty space at Crosstown um, looking, looking for a school. And, and at the time, so this, I, I am not an educator long-term. Um, I have been in the education space my whole career, um, mostly with nonprofits. Um, but the work that I was doing at the time was with an organization that I'd founded called Memphis School Guide that helped parents navigate all of their school choices in Memphis, of which there are a lot for a, a you know, a, a not enormous city. We have a lot of school choices, um, you know, a lot of number of school choices. Um, but what I had realized in this work of creating Memphis School Guide um, and then just talking to families throughout the community was that while there were a lot of different schools that were maybe like located in different places, had different, you know, demographics one way or the other, were differently resourced um, in many cases, what was actually happening in those schools was, was pretty similar across the board um, in that most of them were very traditional schools um, operating on a very traditional model, the same model that quite frankly, we have been following in our public education system for over a hundred years. Um, and you know, as a parent, and I, I really do feel like I came to this largely as a parent initially, um, you know, I, I knew that there was something more that, that I wanted for my kids and that I was hearing from other parents in Memphis um, that they wanted for their kids. Um, and so I read this article about, you know, there being a space at Crosstown. And I had been to, like, I didn't know Todd at the time at all. Um, I had been to a number of the events that he showed pictures of, um, thought Crosstown was really cool. I, I specifically remember one event, Todd, I don't know if we've ever talked about this, but it was a, it was a dinner inside the building and um, like at one point a wind blew through and paint chips from the building like blew off the building and landed in everyone's food. Um, You're not supposed to tell that in public. But it was amazing because like everyone was like, oh, well, here we are, let's keep going. And we're all still here, so it was fine. Um, but you know, it was this incredibly exciting project to be a part of, but I didn't necessarily see that it was, you know, anything that I would be a part of. Um, and then, I was driving down to New Orleans on I-55 between you know, Memphis and New Orleans, and I saw a billboard that looked like this. And it was not this exact billboard, but this is the one you can find on, on the Google. Um, so, but it was, it was the billboard that said this, let's rethink high school. Um, and you know, drove past it, thought, hmm, that's interesting. You know, I wonder what that is. But then got down to New Orleans and there were more billboards and more bus stop ads about this like, let's rethink high school, um, the XQ super school project. And when I got home from New Orleans, because this is not, that's not the sort of thing, research is not what you do in New Orleans. Um, I got home and got on the XQ website and um, I found, a, a, you know, this interesting challenge that they had um, created in back in 2015, um, asking it was a what they were calling, you know, design the high school of the future. They were offering awards of up to five million dollars, um, no, ten million dollars, ten million dollars, um, to teams across the country who were 
coming up with innovative new ideas to tackle um, you know, the problem that exists in American high schools of just lack of student engagement. Um, we have you know, high schools across America where you've got kids sitting in classrooms who maybe look like they're paying attention, but then when you actually survey them and ask them, do they feel engaged in their own education? Less than a third of them say that they, they are engaged in their own education. Um, and, and that's a problem. Um, and so XQ had taken on this, this challenge and was asking others to take on this challenge of redesigning high school. And they literally had a kit that you could order. That's the box, the kit on my, my coffee table um, that I ordered and it came a few days later. And, um, you know, I'd been in these conversations with parents across our community who were looking for something that just didn't exist. Um, and so I emailed all of those people and about a week after the box arrived on my front porch, this group of people was sitting in a co-working space around the corner from my house. Um, this was our first meeting. Um, and when I look at that group of people, you know, some of them ended up staying part of the, our design team. Some of them probably never came back after that first meeting. But when I look at the, that, that group of people, the, the thing that I noticed is that most of them are parents. Um, and, you know, so I, I don't, I didn't come to this as a longtime educator. I came to this as a parent who wanted something different for my kids. And most of these other people did too. Um, now, we ended up attracting a lot of other people to the team. We had educators from 13 different schools in Memphis. Um, we had um, business leaders. We had um, community activists. We had students on the team. Um, they were some of the most important folks, and I'm going to get back around to them. Um, but this was very much a um, community-driven effort to design a school that we felt would work for students in our community. Um, this guy sitting right here in front of the post, um, he had led a design thinking boot camp in Memphis about a year and a half before this that I had somehow stumbled into. And when I looked at the XQ um, challenge, I realized, okay, they played this, this is a design thinking um, problem. I, that is the only training that I had had in design. Um, but I called him up and said, you know, you know what you're doing. Can you come help us? He very generously agreed to. Um, and so our team worked on this design challenge for the next almost year. Um, and, you know, again, we ended up having more than 100 people involved. And I'm going to show you a video quickly of um, what, what came out of that. This is our, our first week of school. We ended up having a, a documentary team that followed us for most of the first year of, of our existence. And so this was created by, um, by that filmmaker. Let me show you this real quick. There are roughly 31,000 high schools in America. 99.5% of those schools are doing things very much exactly the same way. And that works for some students, but that worked for most of us. And now here we are as teachers. The times have changed, things are different. We've asked you to do something that hasn't been done before in Memphis. We don't know everything. As a matter of fact, we know very little in the scheme of how this whole thing will unfold over time. I think that of this model says that you have to iterate and iterate and iterate. Easy answers don't leave room for perfection. All right, I'm Mr. I'm Mr. Punctual Fryer. This is Quincy. This is Perfect Parker. I mean, every first day is the day you freak out. You're, you're trying to understand what's going on, right? You've got to find your balance. Basically, those first weeks in any teaching situation is finding that balance. And I think that's very important. It's hard. It's not easy. You have to be there with them in the, in the thick of it. We are building out a physical space. It lended itself to the group developing like a family very quickly. And I'm excited to see how that bond influences getting the work done. I think that the, the key to our success long-term 
is going to be for each of us to say, I don't know. We cannot, under any circumstance, revert to the norm. To revert to the, the comfortable. We can't go back to, let's, let's put the desk in rows, let's give some grades, and process it just like we did 20 years ago, 10 years ago, five years ago. But we have 150 students, all with diverse backgrounds, different interests, and different skills. And we need to figure out how to connect with each of those students and personally elevate each of their stories and elevate each of their talents and successes. All right, y'all give me one second to get my act together back here with the uh, screen share. Todd, this part is always the challenging part for me too. So I'm glad I'm not alone. Let's see. I seem to have lost my presentation. Every time wise, how are we doing? We're good. Okay. Oh, there it is. Okay. Sorry. Oh. I get too many tabs going. Ted, how how are we doing time wise? That that's not it. Yep. <laughs> we we're good. We do have someone behind the uh, curtain who might be able to help. Well, I think I can do this. Um, I apologize, y'all. That's the joy of technology. I I'm can pull up. My, you be pull up mine, Ginger. Um. Go to your slides. Sure. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, sure. Those were my teachers. They could do it just fine. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll keep going. So, um, yeah, thanks. Just tell so, me when you want me to. Right, the next one. Yep. Thanks, Todd. Saving my bacon. Um, so the, in the design process, we um, ended up coming up with four pillars that we felt like we were hearing from our community were essential if we were going to truly create a high school that was responding to the needs of students in our community. Um, those four pillars are diverse by design, project-based, competency-based, and relationship-based. And I'll give you a very high level on, on each of those and why. But I, I pointed out that those came out of that original design process in 2015 um, because the design process worked. And those are exactly the, the four pillars that we are still working on today. And we, you know, I right before four minutes before I got on this call with, with you guys, I was talking to our director of project based learning about you know, what independent study projects for our juniors and seniors could look like next year, because we are still designing, but we're still designing around those really key elements that came out of that design process. Um, so I want to tell you just a, a tiny bit about each one of them. So you can go on to the next slide, Todd. Um, yeah, and if you guys were prospective parents, I've been giving a lot of these talks to prospective parents for uh, current eighth graders, so I'd go in a lot more depth, but you guys are going to get the high level, and if anybody's interested in attending Crosstown High next year, you can sign up for one of our other presentations. Um, but the first one um, is, is, you know, the one that I think is the most unique if, about, a, you know, being a school in Memphis um, in, in this day and age, because Diversity is honestly not something that you see a lot of in, in our schools in Memphis. Um, there may be some schools that if you look at the overall pie graph of their the demographics of, of their school, that it does look diverse. But unfortunately, when you get into their classrooms, um, it, it starts to look a lot less diverse because there has been a lot of segregating, a lot of tracking of students. Um, starting from when they're very young. And so it ends up that by the time they get to high school, kids are often in classes with kids, other kids who are just a, a whole lot like them um, for, you know, 
in, in whatever way. Um, and we felt like what we were hearing from both the kids that we talked to during our design process and the CEOs who we were talking to, who was saying that one of the biggest challenges in hiring employees was that they, they couldn't find people who could work really well with people who weren't like them, was that we wanted our school to be truly diverse, to truly represent the beauty and um, the, you know, the beautiful diversity of our community. Um, and so as a charter school, we can't, we can't hand select kids. So that means that we have to um, you know, be very strategic in how we market our, our application process. Um, and we have um, been pretty successful in that. We right now have more than 60 middle schools, students from 60 middle schools represented in, in this school in Memphis. We definitely have kids from the neighborhood, but we have kids who are driving from, from far locations who were interested in, in this type of education. Um, and it obviously, our diversity goes beyond just what you can see. Um, it is the talents that kids bring, um, the perspectives they bring based on their, their lived experiences, and all of that really contributes to our diversity. All right, so our next pillar is project-based learning. Um, and you're seeing like some of the, the visuals of some of the things that students have created um, for their projects, actually that the painting in the, the middle and the bottom is actually hanging out in the central atrium right next to Area 51 ice cream. Um, it was, and it's huge, like you can't tell from that, but it is a enormous painting that one of our ninth graders did in response to um, a, a unit in her humanities class on immigration. She had heard um, stories from um, folks that we had brought in to talk to our students about, you know, either their own experiences or working with immigrants or refugees in our community. And she created this painting because she's an artist and that's how she best expresses what she has learned. Um, and, and now it's able, you know, people who come to Crosstown are able to see that. Um, the picture right above that is um, a, a guy who works in the building who um, the, our students were doing a project on education equity and he works for Memphis Education Fund and he you know strolled across the fourth floor um, hallway to meet with our student and talk to her about the work that Memphis Education Fund is doing in um, in Memphis and so the projects are not necessarily just about the, the the cool things that kids create or build it's about the work that they are doing that connects um, what they're learning in the classroom to their own interests and to their community. Um, you can go on to the next one. So the third pillar is um, that we are a competency-based learning school. And you can see, if you can, if you can read those um, on, on the picture, this is a, a big wall that's in the school that, that shows our different competencies. Um, but we really believe that there's, um, there is absolutely value in learning, you know, the, the kind of traditional content, the, you know, what is RNA and DNA and how do you do this algebra two problem and when did the World War II happen and all, you know, those, those, that content that you need to learn. Um, but we also want our students to walk away with skills, with competencies, with things that they can do, ways that they can apply um, the things that they have learned in school. And we want them to be able to apply those in different settings. So if you are learning to, if you're developing in the skill of expressing oneself boldly, which you can see at the, the top center of that picture, um, you can certainly do that through a speech that you give on the theater stairs out in the central atrium. You can do it that way. Or you can do that through um, writing a policy brief to address a, a, a you know, a criminal justice issue in our community. Um, there's a lot of different ways that you can apply these skills in different areas. And so we firmly believe that our students, no matter what they go on and do in life, whether they are become scientists or politicians, um, whatever it is that they are going to be able to use all of these skills for the rest of their life. And then finally, the final pillar is the one that I think undergirds all of them and goes back to this idea of, of community and where, what is the role of, of you know, designing a community. Um, and our fourth pillar is that we are relationship based. Um, and there, you know, there's nothing as I'm giving a tour in the school, there's nothing, there's nothing I point to that say, you know, that says this is what indicates that we are relationship based. Um, but it's baked into everything that we are doing. Um, no one can learn anything from somebody that they don't feel cares about them and that they don't trust. And so 
we work very hard on ensuring that our students get to know and are able to communicate with each other, that they are doing that with our staff, that they are able to form relationships with people you know, in the building outside of our school, um, that they feel like there is a community of people who cares about their success and is willing to come alongside of them and, and work with them on that. Um, and there's different things that we do that's, you know, that is built into the, our day, but it is just a part of kind of the air that we breathe at, at Crosstown is that, that those relationships are really critical. Um, all right, you can go on to the next one. Um, so this is where I had another video, but we may, for the sake of time, skip this, and I will just point it, point you guys to it. Um, I think in the resources that um, you have that's been shared with you, there is um, a link to something called XQ in a box. So I never finished the, I, never, I always forget to tell the end of the story. So we applied to the XQ grant. Um, we made it to the finalist stage in 2016. And then we found out that we did not win one of the initial $10 million prizes, which was really, really disappointing. But at the same time, um, the design process that they had given us was so valuable um, that we had gone on and we were still bringing this school into fruition at, at Crosstown with all everything that we had created in the design, the XQ design phase. Um, as luck would have it, we stayed in touch with them. About a year later, they came back to us and said, um, so you guys are still doing that like without, without us? And they were interested in the progress that we had made. And um, they, long story short, ended up um, adding us to their cohort of schools um, with a very generous award um, and have um, increased that over the years. And so we have benefited greatly, not only financially from our relationship um, with the other XQ schools, um, but just in being able to be a part of a community and a movement of this idea of rethinking what a high school should be about. Um, I know Ron Bokel is on this call with us and we don't know each other yet. This is the first time that we have gotten to meet, but uh, in, in prepping for this, I got to do a little bit of digging on the organization that he's a part of. And it's, it's a separate organization from XQ, but seems to have a very similar um, mission and vision of really rethinking how do we design schools that work for kids today. Um, and so I will leave it there. I'll encourage you to go back to the, the XQ in a box. And if you are have any interest in designing a school, there are tons of great resources there. Um, and I will leave it there. Terrific. Ron, why don't you talk about some of the national initiatives that you've been involved with? Um, and you might say a little bit about the uh, webinar that you put on just about a week ago that had uh, over 300 educators from around the country talking about these very subjects. So Ron, you're on. Well, Ted, first, uh, and Anne Marie, thanks for giving me a front row seat to this conversation. Uh, it's, uh, it's breathtaking to see what you've done. And there's so much that we can learn from what you've done. But Ted, just thinking about, it, we did a national summit last Tuesday and the focus was designing for equity and inclusion. And I was struck by the language that you're using and the language we used last Tuesday. We talked about bringing the school into the community and the community into the school, lower the walls that separate schools from it, their neighborhood. Um, it's not enough to simply build or renovate the school. You also need to build the community, build the neighborhood. And you, you know, I loved your renovating a building and, and building a community. Um, building as a neighborhood. These, these are almost all metaphors about different sorts of things. Your building was like a poor, sad, old, disadvantaged neighborhood that needed to be reinvigorated and recreated and, and, and it had great bones, but it had been neglected. Well, how many of our urban, suburban and rural communities really suffer from that same abandonment, that same lack of investment and and so what, what, what you've done there is a, almost a microcosm of, of what we can be doing in neighborhoods across the country. Um, another observation, Ted, is, is the power of design. Um, uh, your ideas were um, realized because you, you made design a part of your strategy. And, and you could comment all day long about the beauty of the building 
but the building was activated by design and it was a design that helped you activate your vision. So that dynamic relationship between innovation and, and education in this case and new ways of doing things, the role of design is, is a powerful partner. Um, you know, I think also that what you've done is we can learn from what you've done by looking at the result. But I think there's another lesson um, because somebody might look at that and go, well, gee, if only we had a Sears building in our town. Um, well, you know, New York City had an abandoned elevated railway and turned it into a park. Well, not every city has one of those, but every city has stuff. We have, every city has assets. Every city has, you know, even lemons. Uh, like that building was a lemon, but you turned it into something extraordinary. So it's as important, I think, to understand how you did what you did and what your philosophies were that were driving those decisions. Because we can't come up with a Memphis solution anyplace else, but we can learn about what inspired you, what drove you, what the, what the steps were, how did you make it happen, and apply those lessons elsewhere. The last thing I would say is uh, that um, you've demonstrated that extraordinary things can happen in everyday cities. You know, we, we, we say, oh, New York does this, San Francisco does that. But what about Memphis? What about Oklahoma City? What about cities that are pulling themselves up and saying, we're gonna do this because we know we need to do this for our town, for our people. So what you're, what you're doing, and I'm not telling you anything that a million people haven't already told you, I'm just saying there's so much we can learn from what you've done. And I look forward to following up and, and taking your lessons and seeing if we can help other communities find a solution. The last thing I would say, and you touched on this, coming out of the pandemic, it's gonna be so tempting for folks to go back and do it the way they've always done it because educators are burnt out by the time this is over. And so in our session the other day, uh, one of our panelists said, we are the we. And I didn't get that. And I sort of said, well, that's, but then I started thinking about it. And, and that is the, the thing that we have to embrace is that we have to make change. We have to come together and be the we that makes that happen. So thank you for creating such an inspiring story. And I'm sure that your people there love it. I, I'm, I'm coming, when the pandemic's over, Ted, I'm going to Memphis. Besides, you've got pretty good food there. I'm just saying. Absolutely. So, so I don't, and, and Maria, I could spend so much time. I'd love to dialogue more with, with both of you, but maybe we can do that offline. And, uh, but again, I think, the words we're using, you've demonstrated that those words have power and those words have meaning. And so that gives me confidence, Ted, that some of the ideas that we're advancing, you know, have a place where uh, it has been put in place in excellent ways. So great. That's all I had to say. Great thoughts, Ron. Yeah, thank you. So let me, let me start by uh, asking a, a few questions. Um, none of you are developers, um, and yet you saw within uh, this particular property the opportunity to really transform uh, a neighborhood and, and a community. So um, we know a little bit about how you got into it, but how did you learn the skill sets from, from whence did you acquire the skill sets in order to make a project of this scale function? Ooh, can I answer that real quick? Sure. This demonstrates the power of project-based learning. Todd, did you learn a whole lot over the past 10 years? <laughs> I say I always got, I got my second PhD uh, over the last two, two, 10 years. Uh, it, it's, it's true. I mean, Ginger, you're, you're right. But I would also say it's all about surrounding yourself with people who, uh, who are really, really wonderful people, but also know what they're doing. So there's a reason I have co-founder of Crosstown Arts by my name and co-leader of Crosstown Concourse. Uh, McLean Wilson was the was the developer. He um, he his he comes from a long lineage of developers in his family. He had um, had been developing doing commercial real estate development in Raleigh, North Carolina. He's from Memphis, 
his granddad actually, Kimmons Wilson, started Holiday Inn. And so um, he, he has the entrepreneurial spirit in, in, his, um, in his blood. And when he came back to Memphis and developing, he also had control of his own time. And so he could, he could um, be a part of this project. Uh, we were introduced, I didn't know McLean and we were introduced. We moved back to Memphis uh, about the same time. And about a year and a half later, I told him what was going on. And so um, that started a long conversation, but um, I did learn a lot in terms of financing, in terms of design, um, in terms of land acquisition, all of those things. But at the same time, it wouldn't have been possible without McLean and a couple other people who were on the development team who were developers. We, we have uh, two related questions, um, which you have uh, hinted at uh, the answers to. How exactly did you create buy-in from the community and how have you connected with uh, other communities in Memphis? Uh, for example, what's the nature of public transportation or other kinds of infrastructure that might connect the communities to each other? Yeah. Let's start with how you got buy-in from that local community. Yeah, I would say two ways. One was through the arts and all of the events and programming. Um, it, you know, we would do an event around what do you want in your neighborhood uh, or an event around music or, um, or a gallery show or a block party or, you know, all sorts of things. And when I say hundreds, I mean three, four a week. Uh, in terms of just bringing people into the neighborhood. And so they just got into the habit of time. You know, Crosstown is a place where you go to have these unique high quality experiences. And the, the, the surrounding neighborhood felt included. We would have town hall meetings about uh, what was going on, what we were thinking, getting their buy-in. Uh, so that's, that's one thing is just literally on the ground, having events and ongoing events and programming weekly. The development office was across the street from the building. So it's not like we were a development company that had its headquarters downtown or out in East Memphis. We were lit you could come knock on our door uh, across the street if you had a concern or an idea. Um, the second thing is, is who our, who our founding partners were, our anchor tenants, Church Health, St. Jude, Methodist, uh, Teach for America, Memphis Teacher Residency, you know, all of these arts, education, and healthcare um, organizations that were local, number one, and number two, they had 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 enormous amount of credibility with the with the community, and so for those anchor tenants um, to be there, for us to be able to offer a, a free public high school, to be able to offer healthcare to the working uninsured, uh, to be able to offer you know contemporary art galleries that were free to free to come to, you know we're 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 bringing to the community a, a lot of uh, resources that weren't there before, but that everybody wanted. So I would say events and programming and then who our main tenants were. Um, the, the affordable housing that you've developed uh, came about within uh, local and national constraints uh, around how one develops affordable housing. Could you talk a little bit about the financials on that? Who gets to live here? Uh, there? Sure. Um, fill us in on that. Yeah, so uh, I mean, yes and no. We, we, we got something called a pilot payment in lieu of taxes, which is a tax freeze, where one requirement for that is 20% affordable housing if you're developing residential. There's also 20% affordable housing requirement related to new markets tax credits. But even before that, one of our founding partners is Memphis Teacher Residency. It's kind of Memphis's local version of Teach for America. Um, they recruit um, recent graduates from across the country, they come to Memphis. They, um, they earn a, a, a tuition-free master's in education and they're providing ha provided housing for a year in return for committing to teach in Memphis's highest need urban schools uh, for three years after that. So it's a four-year residency, similar to a medical residency, for example. So we have about um, 65 to 70 um, teachers in residence who live in the building. We've got about 12 artists in residence and about 20 doctors in residence related to St. Jude. And that was the plan even before we got the financing um, related to, to, to affordability. Um, but we do have uh, 53 apartments that are, in order to live there, you have to make 80% or less of the area median income. 
and then it also caps um, what the rent that could be charged on those apartments, and that's just defined by HUD each year, um, you know, based on the numbers that they use. Now, speaking of uh, teachers living there, how did you find a leader for the school? Um, yeah, so it was, a, so as I, as I said, I am not a traditional school leader. They haven't been able to get rid of me yet, but we did find somebody who actually knew what they were doing when it came to, to running a school. So we did, it was a fairly traditional search process um, to, you know, we did a national search for an executive director who was, you know, who had experience with, with startups, um, but was willing to sign on to do something very different. Um, and our, our executive director is Chris Terrell. He has been with us since the very beginning. I think we hired him in December of 2016. Um, and, you know, he, and to his credit, he signed on before XQ um, granted us super school status. So he came before he knew that there were going to be extra resources and, and extra help, extra support. Um, but he has been an incredible leader throughout this. Perhaps both uh, you and Ron could respond to the question of um, how you have uh, both assembled and sustained the synergies that exist uh, within one building. That is, you have housing, you have health, you have art, uh, you have some recreation, you have culture, um, and you have a school. Um, how, how did those synergies work with each other and also um, how are you sustaining programs in the midst of what COVID is doing uh, to uh, reduce the, the kind of uh, public interactions that you can have? All right, I, real quick, I just have a quick story. My favorite time at Crosstown is, well, pre and post COVID, uh, the central atrium has a main elevator and um, about eight o'clock in the morning, you can get on the elevator and there's, there's a couple of healthcare executives, you know, in their suits going up to the office there's two or three students going to school, and then there's there's a couple of residents in their pajamas having just taken their dog out. <laughs> and, and like the first year, it was totally awkward. <laughs> and then, you know, everybody just got used to it. And finally, it was like, sleep well, <laughs> uh, have a good day at work, you know, study hard. Uh, and, and that's just kind of how it's come to be. You just get used to it. Sorry, go ahead. And Ron, could you talk about these... Um... Uh, mixed use communities that uh, were once thought of just as school facilities, but have now become uh, places where uh, your health is, your mail is delivered, your uh, FedEx is delivered, your um, uh, kids are educated. How, how do those work? Well, uh... So we're doing, we're actually in the process now of beginning to do research on communities that have such campuses and have such schools. And so I'm in the process of learning more about it now, but I do know that in many cases you have to have a, um, a governing structure that kind of binds together all of the pieces. And, uh, and it shouldn't be the school. The school's got plenty to do already, um, but there does need to be some kind of a a superstructure that kind of keeps the pieces all functioning together and deals with some of the common challenges, insurance and multi, mul multiple uses of facilities by different people and so forth. Um, I'd be curious, uh, Todd and Ginger, in, in your case, how, how, do you, how do you bind together all of the pieces in a, in a, in a structure or a system that kind of keeps everybody playing well together? other than the people in their pajamas, that is, of course. You wanna go, Ginger? You can... Well, I mean, I can talk about it. Todd, Todd's probably better equipped to talk about it from the actual, like, how does all of that happen on a very day-to-day -day basis? I can say that, you know, from, from my perspective, as somebody who mostly is concerned with, you know, how our school fits into this community, um, one of the things that's been great is being a part of um, the Crosstown Advisory Board, where you know, on a frequent basis, I get to come and meet with, um, you know, the the CEO of Church Health, 
and um, you know the folks with Methodist Hospital and um, other organizations in the building. And we just, we share ideas. We talk about challenges. We talk about parking every single time because um, that's when you gotta do that. Um, but we also talk about other things that um, are just ideas for how we can be better together better. Um, and, you know, we, we do, we talk about both the, the, the good parts and the hard parts. Um, and, you know, from my perspective, I'm coming with um, this coming school year, we'll have 500 teenagers um, who we are responsible for. And there are some folks who, if they come to work, don't expect to be confronted with 500 teenagers. And so there are challenges to that, but I think it's our job to, you know, bring to this community to help help equip our students um, to be good members of the community, to um, be people who um, are learning from the other people in the building, but are also contributing to the community. Um, and so, like, it's it's just it's like being a part of any other community. It can be messy, um, but it can also be really beautiful. So, Ron, I have yeah. one last question for you. Um, Ted, real, real quick on that uh, last question, I'll, I'll just say quickly. Um, so I'm president of Crosstown Re Redevelopment Cooperative. So the building functions as a co-op. So I report to a board and the members of that board are representatives from our tenants. Uh, so if you occupy 35,000 square feet or more, you have a spot on the board. And so to your point, Ron, about making sure that the retail, the office, the residential, there's a reason why all of those things are usually developed separately. Uh, everything from trash to, to um, you know, elevator usage to just the practical things of how, how custodial security, all of those things, um, it's really up to me and the board to make sure uh, on a daily basis that those things are running seamlessly. Um, but ultimately, the building works as a as a co-op. So, so Ron, what is your understanding of um, how much money is likely to be devoted over the next few years to infrastructure improvements, uh, whether in new building or uh, renovations of old, that will be focused on schools and creating these kinds of communities? So. Um... Before the pandemic, we were uh, playing catch up as a country uh, uh, with a um, historic some amounts being spent on school design, construction, and so forth. I think about $50 billion a year. Um, and the catch up was from the 2008, 2009 recession. Um, so we, we think that money, I mean, that money is still there. It's just hasn't really been being invested during the pandemic as much. But then surprisingly, another $57 billion in bond issues were passed just this last November, right in the middle of the pandemic. So there's a building boom in the school, uh, in the school space. Uh, Todd, you and Ginger will appreciate that the problem is that before the pandemic, 90% of the schools being built were built on a 1950s model instead of, um, instead of active learning or project-based learning or other kinds of ways that we may want to engage students. And basically we build dumb buildings that uh, we stick stuff in. And so it's, it's a challenge, Ted, to leverage those massive investments to think differently about how we create school space. Um, we don't know yet, but the Biden administration, Biden-Harris and the leadership in Washington will most certainly be pushing infrastructure dollars into cities across the country. And we're hopeful and have some reason to be, maybe competence too strong a word, that some of those dollars will be aimed at schools and, and especially around the idea of community schools, which in a way is what you all have in Memphis. Maybe. Maybe you think about it that way, maybe you don't, but it really is kind of a model of, of a community school. So um, as, as cities and mayors and governors and others think about how can we practically have an impact on this issue of equity in education, I think investing in uh, community schools, investing in concepts like you all have fostered in Memphis, uh, Ted, is is a great way for public dollars to have a direct and, and really uh, strong impact on 
uh, the issue of inequity, lack of opportunity, the lack of inclusion. So, so we're at the end of our time, and I would just conclude that um, even if one doesn't necessarily receive support from uh, an external uh, foundation over the next uh, few years, uh, there will be a significant investment made um, in schools and in schools that serve a wider population uh, than uh, what has been the case in the past. And the example coming out of Memphis, I think, is a great model. Um, they have uh, produced uh, uh, videos and uh, you can uh, access information about them both uh, directly uh, from the, the team you've seen here and through the Bruner Foundation, uh, which uh, gave them an award for uh, what they have produced here, which I think is just a, a great example of how uh, progressive thinking uh, can bring people together and produce a result that is much more than uh, what we think of as a traditional school building. So Anne-Marie, final comments? Well said, Ted, and, and thank you, Ginger, Todd, and Ron. This was this is terrific. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, you can visit our website and read our, our we've got a detailed case study about the process, how Crosstown came to be, and more information on the founding partners and tenants and its impact uh, in the community. So I encourage you to check that out. We also have a number of award winners within our network that address education from all different angles. So uh, that's another resource for you to dive into as well as uh, the web page on our website about this session. Uh, next week, we're going to head a little bit further south. Ginger mentioned being on the road to New Orleans. That's where we're headed next week. Uh, we will learn about how a university-based community design center partnered with local, uh, local youth to build the city's first public skate park. So it's a Another wonderful story about collaboration and how you can do a lot um, through partnerships. So we encourage you to join us. Thank you all. And we'll see you next week. And my personal thanks to our presenters tonight.